Mecca Hall. For this occasion, and most of us, some of us, are in different places or at all. We thank God that we are still able to meet and felicitate together and 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 i pray I that we'll have many more years of uh, okay. normal meetings of her uh, boys okay. and girls sons and daughters of his aleko first of all i must wish all of us merry christmas it's not as merry as we are used to but we thank God that we are still living and the virus has not taken us away. I pray that the virus itself will clear from the surface of the earth as soon as possible. Now that the vaccine has been discovered, and I hope and that I the that. federal government federal is making adequate preparation to ensure that uh, we get our own delivery of vaccine in January, not February, not March, to cure or to protect the millions of Nigerians, especially the vulnerable ones. Virus knows no age. Old and young, but Allah will conquer. We are all in His hands. Virus will not take us away. I can hear your amen very loudly. Amen. I would like to wish all of us also Happy New Year. Happy New Year. We are all in the hands of God. The beneficent, the merciful, the all-knowing. And we pray to him to accept our prayer and wipe out very quickly this uh, virus from the surface of Nigeria. As soon as possible. Uh, it's with regret that um, we witnessed the desecration of the seat of power in Lagos, in Nigeria, at Isaleko a few weeks ago. It's very, very sad to see those pictures on the TV, the invasion of the palace of Oba of Lagos. We pray that it will never, never again happen. Amen. We pray it will never, ever happen. We pray that no one's home or place of business will experience that sort of devastation. While we say this, we also urge the various governments to be up and doing, to serve the people the governor is a servant of the people, not the master of the people. Govern well. Govern with the constant remembrance that God has given you the power to be governor. 
the honor to be governor. It's a switch. It says alone. We pray that God will not take the power from you on ceremonial day. Or take the honor from you ceremonial day. Because it belongs to him and him alone. So govern well. Govern well. The monies you collect, oh, make sure that you spend the money in the best interest of the population. So that people will speak of you not only today but in future as someone who left his mark on the sands of time. I hope that the riots which followed will not be repeated, but the government must not create the situation for such riots we found all over Lagos in recent weeks. The government must always constantly remember, as I've said earlier on, that power belongs to God alone. It's on loan to us. It's on loan to the governor. Honor is on loan to the governor. I pray that uh, the honor, the power, if used judiciously in the best interest of the people, will not be taken away from the governor. There is tremendous tension still in town, still in the country, still in Lagos. The traffic problem, which ought not to, to occur if only those in authorities and those companies to whom concessions have been given by the government some years ago, the ports concession, if they had used their power very well. These days, it's been three hours, four hours on the traffic. We hope that normalcy will uh, prevail as soon as possible when the repairs going on, which unfortunately we are not properly, they are not staggered in time. If the repairs are completed, normalcy will come back to uh, their society. Well, sons and daughters of Isaleko, the heart of Lagos. Isaleko, the heart of Lagos. Lagos, the heart of Nigeria. Nigeria, very nice. Tomo, Tomo. Tomo, Tomo. Amin, sir. Amin, sir. Enjoy Amin. the day. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Wish you stay, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Hello. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, thank you very much, Alaji Okunu. It's always a pleasure to visit with him because we leave there more informed about who we are and um, what we're about. 
And so without much ado, I would like us to go on to the business of the day. So I'm going to invite um, our panelists in no particular order, um, come and take their seats as I introduce them so that we can start the business of the day. So I'm first going to call um, Mr. Olashupo Shashore San, who is to be our keynote speaker. And as he comes, I will tell you about him. Senior advocate of Nigeria, and he's a partner at ALP Legal, that's African Law Test, a leading commercial law firm in Nigeria. Although well known for his defense of multinationals and state sovereigns in many disputes in the Supreme and Appellate Courts in Nigeria, he is notably best to his career for of Lagos from earliest times with some of the country's leading academic, academic historians. After serving in law enforcement and public administration as Attorney General and Commissioner for Justice of Lagos 2007 to 2011, mm. um, he made time for his part-time research and writing, resulting in the award-winning narrative history works Possessed, the history of the Brown Colony of Lagos. Um, King and Colony, a short history of the British possession of Lagos. And I say, but not Lecky. Can I give you Lecky number? You should get that. I bought that book and um, got it back to school. And by the next day, um, the children had been through the book already. So a really good one to read, especially for the young ones. A platter of gold, making of Nigeria. Um, he's a Nigeria Advisory Board of the Commonwealth Enterprise and Investment Council and member of its International Advisory Board. He's chairman of the Nigerian Commonwealth Walk Away Committee Festival, that's LTF Foundation. Um, some of his older books and um, other books are Jurisdiction and Sovereign Immunity in Nigeria, in Nigerian Commercial Law, that's NIA 2007, Commercial Arbitration Law and National practice in Nigeria, ministering justice, administration of the justice sector in Nigeria. He's passionate about Nigeria's unsung heroes and promoting international history, particularly Nigeria's heritage within world history. A self styled amateur investigative historical researcher, he advocated for the return of history to the educational curriculum of Nigeria's school system and mm. for evil and colonial African story. In a combination of both of his keen interests, he's one of the pioneer society of Nigeria. He recently as writer and presenter of the seven part documentary series, Journey of an African Colony and a platter of gold untold Nigeria. Let me welcome to okay, where's come? Next, I have Billy Kiss Adebi Abiola, the Director General of Lashrab. Billy Kiss founded We Cyclers a for-profit social enterprise that promotes environmental sustainability, social welfare, and community health by utilizing low-cost cargo bicycles called recycles to provide convenient recycling services to households in densely populated low-income neighborhoods. Recyclers motivates families to recycle through an SMS-based incentive program that rewards them with points for recycling that can be converted to cell phone minutes, basic food items, and household goods. Recyclers has won several awards, including the 2019 King Baudouin Foundation's Africa Development Prize. 
She was recognized as one of the 2016 Quartz African Motivators, identified as one of Africa's top entrepreneurs in the waste recycling business by Small Starter, named as one of the 2016 Ventures Africa 42 African Innovators to Watch, and honored as one of 20 African women with powerful and inspiring voices by Applause Africa. Billy Case also published a patent during her time as a software engineer with IBM. Billy Case completed an MBA at the Sloan School of Management at the Massachusetts, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And as a student, she was a Legatum Fellow at MIT's Legatum Center for Development and Entrepreneurship and Vice President of the MIT Sloan African Business Club. Additionally, she holds an MSc in Computer Science from Vanderbilt University and a BSc in Computer Science from Fisk University. She is a Carol Wilson Fellow, an Echoing Green Fellow, and a 2013 recipient of the Cartier Women's Initiative Award. <laughs> Professor Chinodu. Professor Adele Ginodu, a professor of political. Prof is a KCOB. For those of you who don't know what that stands for, the King's College Old Boy. Oh, yeah, you can hear that. Elijah Okuno at home is saying Floria. He has been political science from University of Minnesota. His lecturing career took him to Amadebelo University, University of Lagos, and Lagos State University. Appointments. He's a member of the National Electoral Commission from 1987 to 1992, Director General Administrative Staff College of Nigeria from 1992 to 1996, Member Governing Council, University of Calabar from 1997 to 2000, Member Governing Council, Lagos State University, 1983 to 1986. Member Summit University Offer, 2016 to 2020. Member Governing Board, Nigerian National Merit Award since 2017. Professional appointments, President of the African Association of Political Science, Vice President, International Political Science Association, Consultant to the African Union, and the Economic Commun Commi Commission for Africa and ECOWAS Network of Electoral Commissions. Visiting professor at University of Zimbabwe, Michigan State University, Indiana University, and Center for Development mm -hmm. Research, University of Bonn, and University of, of Uppsala, Sweden. He's also currently Senior Fellow, Center for Democracy and Development. So I don't know where you find time. Okay. Then I have Dr. Taibat Lawanson. Unfortunately, will be will not be here physically with us. She'll be joining us um, um, by dish. <laughs> She is an associate professor of urban planning at the University of Lagos, Nigeria, where she leads the Propor Development Research Cluster and serves as co-director at the Center for Housing and Sustainable Development. Her research focuses on the interface, social complexities, urban realities, and the quest for environmental justice. She's particularly interested in how formal and informal urban, urban systems size in emerging African contexts. <coughs> she co-convened the recently concluded exhibition and series of intellectual debates on Lagos, ownership and identities. <coughs> She's an Isaliko indigen from the... <coughs>
She's an Insalico indigene from the Damali family of Itagarao. So, welcome, Dr. Taibat Lawanson. Thank you for having me. Last but not the least, we have Emeka Kiazo, uh, normally called Ed Kiazo. He's a lawyer, an author, a historian, and filmmaker. Is the author of the following critically acclaimed works The Lagos Hamburg Lie, A Brief History of German Commerce in Nigeria from 1590 to 2016, 120 Great Nigerians We Never Knew, The Federation Cup and Nigerian Football, amongst others. His documentary film works include the critically acclaimed Lagos, The Birth and Growth. <laughs> January 15, 1970, Untold Memories of the Nigeria Biafra War. Company Yaya, Lost African Voices of World War II. He's a member of the Board of Trustees of the Nigerian Legal History Society. He was the consultant historian of the government of Nigeria centenary documentary, We Are Nigerians and a recipient of an award from the African Society of Cambridge University in 2014 for his work in African history. And um, let me also add, he is born and brought up on Molobo. So now we've been introduced to all our panelists. I'm going to um, step aside and have Mr. Shashare come and present his keynote address. Afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and those of you who up here with us, but here digitally. I'm almost embarrassed to be asked to deliver a keynote address, even though, uh, even though I don't have much of a keynote address, but to be here with uh, Professor Dinoju sitting down and to be delivering, my uncle to be sitting down and delivering a keynote address, it's almost embarrassing to me. So, oh, who's it? <laughs> <laughs> so you probably hear him deliver the keynote address after me. So let me just say what I what I um, the remarks that I have. Um, I mean, I um, and all of you here today. I first of the recent Israeli code uh, days. Uh, I think I last year because I was out of the country, but um, this is a this is a union. This is an occasion that's very close to my heart. Um, I think it's um, fantastic that we are insisting on celebrating our indigeneity. It is a United Nations acclaimed right to have indigenous rights. They're citizens' rights. People can come to Lagos and say, I'm a Lagosian because I'm a taxpaying Lagosian. Yeah, that's fine. And I, therefore, I can live in Lagos. That's fine. The Nigerian constitution allows that. But you cannot, by taxation, become an indigent. And an indigent is an inalienable right. You can it from is a universal, universally acclaimed United Nations declared right. Mm -hmm. My skirt, and I drink yombo in the morning, and I use to wash my mouth. And if your yo is my right, and you can't take that away from me, and if I celebrate my indigeneity in that way, 
it is an inalienable right that even the constitution can take from me. So I'm very proud of the people who sustained this, you know, you know yourself, uh, who sustained this, uh, the people younger than him, but not so young anymore. <laughs> Talk about Lagos. Isaliko, Isaliko as the, um, the significant Isaliko in the history of Nigeria. Chosen to to start this off, but I think maybe I should set the scene. After setting the scene, I will talk about some characteristics of of the island, and then I will talk about the gravamen. What historically shows the significance of the Saleko. And then I'll stop there for others to make some comments. But let me set the scene. And I think one of the first admonitions I always give to my friends who are deeply involved in this cause is that Isaleko is the north eastern, northwestern tip of Lagos Island. What is Lagos Island. And we should not subliminally or inadvertently seed the fact that other people now say they are from Lobo or they are from Lafayette as to me, it's just but a part of Lagos Island. It's Lagos Island, Lagos Island, first of all. Thank you, sir. I heard it. Lagos Island, and gradually we admitted people, cosmopolitan as we are, took pockets. So, Island is Aleko. Lagos Island is Isaliko. Is uh, before I leave this terrain, would be to sponsor, support, and be deeply involved. And those of you who've heard me say this thing before, guys, that's your business, I'll say it again. To be deeply involved in an archaeological dig and survey of Lagos Island, particularly the oldest part of Lagos Island, because I think we have many dates that we have been banding around. Many dates are not accurate. Saliko is much older than we think it is. And like they do in other parts of the world, archaeological surveys and uh, excavation will reveal the times to corroborate or explain gaps in our time. I suspect we will find, I have no doubt that we will find, and I'm working on it with some uh, a French consortium, and I look forward to people who want to volunteer. I suspect that we will find when we dig the northwestern tip of this island, well, not this one, the next island, <laughs> we will find that some of our dates need to be recalibrated. Because we've seen timelines on John Lushi and the Otumba, you know, unscientific people. So, yeah. So, I'm just trying to set the scene. For, for this conversation to, to make you understand that um, this is not an unimportant part of the world. Victor. Lagos Island itself, um, again, apologies if you've heard me say this before, is an alluvial island. It is an alluvial island. You've heard me say this before. Alluvial island. By that I mean it is not a tectonic island. A tectonic island is an island that is created by uh, movements of land. Madagascar is a rock in the sand. And many parts of the Caribbean, they're just rocks. Can I find something called money for me? Over time, mm -hmm. sedimentation and so movements and, uh, 
of sediments. Its shape and size grew over time. So you, there's no day, there is no day that Lagos Island started. You cannot find that day. Nobody can say, I was the first person on Lagos Island because it happened over a very long period of time. And both earth form and human beings came from time to time. So I find this conversation about the original class, I find it from my investigation of history, I find it inconsistent with the facts that Glenn invented. It is alluvial and the proof of it is that Lagos Island, the first two occupations that anybody there had was fishing and farming, which you find common with sedimentation. The fertile land. That's why there are so many places in Lagos Island called farming. Okoa'u. Dugong is what? It's a farm. And everybody knows that all our ancestors were farmers, fishers, fishermen. And it is because of the character. So we also need to understand the character of where we're coming from. It's part of our identity. It's not enough for us to say, no, we know those things. We will learn more about those things. But we also need to know the character of we come from because it develops who we are. Um, this island, uh, and again, I'm juxtaposing Isaleko with Lagos Island. I don't like this. Oh, I'm uh, Brazilian. Oh, I'm mm -mm. the oldest part of the island. The oldest inhabited part of the island was the northwestern tip. So everybody took off from there. But in those days, and I'm talking in the 15th century, 14th century, no, probably before the 14th century, the island faced the mainland, the body of water across, because that was where the biggest threat to their existence came from. Some people from the forest there. That was what, that's why the settlers went to the northwesternmost tip because that's the most vantageous position that you can see the water where the enemy was coming from. But that's what happened in the 1400s. Yeah. Some people from behind them. They never expected it. What was called a Betty, the place that we used to go and throw things away, the back of our kingdom. So came the front. Okay. Yeah, yeah. He's going to use. Put his aleko at the back. Let me tag you from there. We have a Senate. And now is the ultimate description that I've seen from the 1735. Ruled through a Senate of Chiefs. Africa, 1735. Chiefs. So he ruled through a Senate of Chiefs. The only reason why they could refuse what he did was it was if it went against the interests of the chiefs, but it was absolute. And I'm just trying to set. So this ruler get this ruler got ten percent of everything that was ten percent. Imagine it today, if even the, the Nigeria got ten percent of everything that was exported. That's a rich man. Mm -hmm. You had to go. I don't want to go in front. So. What did they drive? Not to go away. Oh God! The history. We get there if we look at all of it. That 
the Nigeria that was going to be. It wasn't Nigeria then. The government. The Israel Niger company came to our town in of colonial rule, you will understand that there were three major important planks of colonial intervention. There was the colonial office, surprise, surprise. Colonial office, sounds familiar. It was the most senior part of service in those days. Not the best, but it attracted the most adventurous. So you found a lot of Scottish people in the colonial service. Then there was the foreign office. The foreign office was pure civil service. It got in all sorts of aristocrats and landed gentry, people from public school, people who had gone to the best universities. Creme. And then you had Her Majesty's Treasury. Nothing could happen without Her Majesty's Treasury. Now, Majesty's Treasury did not come by boat to Nigeria, but it played a big role. And Her Majesty's Treasury favored the Foreign Office. And I'll tell you why I'm telling you this story. The, Her Majesty's the Foreign Office, first of all, there were all the prep school boys were there, all the old Eton, Cambridge, all of them were in that school. But the rougher necks were in the Colonial Office. The Scottish boys who were ready to go far and wide and risk their lives in places that were difficult to get to. Lagos, is a product of the colonial office. The rest of Nigeria is a product of the colonial office. So it begins to show you that our destinies were never the same. When in 1851, and here we get to the significance point, when in 1851, through the machinations of uh, a scoundrel called, uh, what's his name again? He's such an abhorrent man, I forget his name. What's his name? Hmm? Beecroft. John Beecroft. Okay, that place, I don't know how to do it. We go and talk. I don't know how they throw us from here and there. Uh, <laughs> did. You do that. The the that it's very tough. The first country that they first established in this whole area. Uh, uh, hell, that's why they would have passed the country they said. That's go straight and go. As there was still connections with the Europeans in other Africa, no, in other parts of the area to be called Nigeria. So that by the time the Foreign Office had given charters to companies like the Royal Niger Company, the Royal Niger Company is very important, though people will just look at it and think it's peculiar to us. The Royal Niger Company gave birth to the East Africa Company. So it, it, it mutated into other charters. It was the first charters in Africa. That, and it was a child of the scramble. It was a child of the scramble. It wasn't a child of cold, meditated design to seize and possess an island and a port, which was what Lagos was. It was a cold decision in the corridors of Downing Street. They said, I mean, we want this place. So when I wasn't surprised when I came across a letter that uh, of uh, Hussein Diko Adele wrote, I think it was um, in 1952 to um, uh, 53, because it was, uh, no, it was to the king. It's not, because it was to the queen. I have it at home. So I'll, I'll double check it. They didn't you. Sorry. They didn't roja you. When the question. <laughs> 
Yeah. Papa says, Hello, Your Majesty. Remember who I am. I am the so, so you had said you were supposed to do what? Who you signed a treaty with in 1861. Okay. And I hear you are doing constitutional okay. and I'm to be of a place called West Region. I'm bigger than Western Region. Predates this country you are trying to create. You must create a Lagos region. Mm -hmm. I am a number mm -hmm. of Of course, it fell on deaf ears, but the point was made that I was sovereign before you knew these people. And that's the significance, that's one of the significances of Lagos to Nigeria. That this was the sovereign that she recognized at first. Just quickly skip to um, what that treaty in 1861 said. When, and, and you know, everybody's heard about the oh, 6th of August treaty from Matthias, the smooth, the vaccination, yeah, they just didn't like it, whatever those stories are, some of them are not so accurate, but. Uh, <laughs> But the treaty with Isaleko was unique in the sense that it was not about trade routes. Don't forget, I said this wasn't a charter company. This was a design to establish a nation. And I'm sure all of you know, uh, some of you are much older than me here, you recall that Lagos colony people were Lagos were British citizens. People of the protectorate were Lagos, uh, British subjects. In fact, the Supreme Court said when Labolo Davis was trying to escape uh, bankruptcy uh, by saying that there was no bankruptcy, bankruptcy law uh, available in Nigeria, the judge said, no, 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 no. Lagos is part of Britain. And the dicta is that Lagos is part of Britain and the laws of Britain apply as if this soil was British and he was adjudged bankrupt. But this is a clause that I like. Well, I don't like, but makes us different. The clause in the 1861 treaty. It says, to give, transfer, and by these presents, grant and confirm unto the queen of Great Britain, her heirs, etc., forever, forever the port and island of Lagos, with all its profits and territories. That profit of 10%, oh, <laughs> the king had dashed. No other treaty reads like this. All these other treaties were give us trade routes, access to the hinterland, free trade. Make sure you don't bring anybody to disturb us. In Lagos, they were after the territory because they knew what the port represented. They knew the port was the access, they called it the entry port to the hinterland. They were after access to the hinterland. They wanted to own the port. They were not interested in the rest of Nigeria. They were not interested. In fact, there was a division in cabinet as to who told you to seize Lagos. We just wanted it to be a consular office. But Pickroft had other designs and he was supported by other people. So, Ladies and gentlemen, this fishing community, this fertile farmland on the north easternmost tip of Lagos Island is the mother city of Nigeria. Without Lagos, there would be no Nigeria. I guess that was the point uh, that uh, Obadele was making in his letter. That how can you put me under a battle that was created in 1830 something? I wrote you, you and I were talking in 14 something, my least my granddad. Then you want me to be under a battle. Please do. Where are you creating region? Create Lagos region.
I'm not sure we will ever get there in this event that we have. But the Saleko Descendants Union is a step in reminding people they should never forget that Lagos is not subservient to Nigeria. Lagos is Lagos. The significance of Lagos to Nigeria cannot be overemphasized. Um, we are not children of a scramble. We are cosmopolitan because we chose to be cosmopolitan. By the early 1700s, it is on record. You could find Arabs, you could find Tuaregs from Timbuktu, you could find Ijebus, you could find Mandingos, you could find all manner of people coming to exchange wares. There were 20,000 people in 1735 living in Lagos. That's a lot of people in 1725. So, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know that I could do better justice to kick off this by way of a keynote and to just to say that long may the Isaliko Descendants Union last. Long may this initiative continue. Long may the celebration of this day in the celebration of our indigenous rights, the recognition of who we are and our collective identity and what it means not only to us, our children and our children's children and those yet to be born, but a reminder to the rest of Nigeria. from our president, president of the board of trustees, and it goes, Gedebe Lehua. Thank you very much, um, Madam Speaker. We will just um, have the other speakers speak, and then we'll go into a time of um, discussion, just so that there's a flow. If you have questions, just to keep them and um, you'll get a chance to ask them. And the same goes to um, those online as well. Thank you. So I think we'll have, next we'll have um, Professor Adeliji Lodu, So. I can get to the restaurant. KBC, KBC, represented by his uh, white cap chiefs. Our ageless and incomparable Bon Alaji Femi Okunu. You've been a model for many of us, and we remain very proud of you. We only hope that we have not fallen short of your expectations, and that you in turn are also proud of us. The chairman and members of the Selected Senators Union, I want to begin by thanking you for the honor of this platform. When Shuko started, he was a bit intimidated by my presence. Mm -hmm. But I'm even 
more intimidated now <laughs> by <laughs> brilliant performance. Okay. I think we are set. A very, very difficult target for me to do much better than he has done, or at least to try as much as possible to equal his performance. But I say that because I'm also very proud of him. I'm proud of him because uh, I don't think he knows this, but his, his mother was my classmate at Saro Wow. And uh, we, we worked together at the Federal Ministry of Justice before I left for Oxford in 1965. His father, the late Shashara of Lagos, was one of those I looked up to in my teen, not my in my teenage years at the Party Boys Club in Lagos. Mm -hmm. And he was somebody who also took an interest in me and encouraged me in several ways. And when he was in London at the High Commission, he would always always uh, send me something nice from London when I was in Oxford as a student. And he was then with, with uh, Mr. Justice L.J. Dosum, who was then the Deputy High Commissioner in London. So I think I want to follow in his footsteps. But I want to do so in the mold of somebody trained in political and social theory. I want to be both provocative and also uh, intellectual in a way. And what I have started, when I asked last night, before I started composing my, my presentation today, I was told that uh, we'll have about four, five to six minutes. I did not feel that I'll be a big paper. So what I did was, because I like to, on occasions, I, on occasions like this, I try to be, to, to, to present my case in as compact and as a systematic way as possible. And my presentation, I don't think will last more than five minutes. What I, what I have done in my presentation, and it, it covers several of the facets of uh, Schubert's presentation. I'm beginning with what I hope will be the message from my presentation. Then I look at the role in Nigerian history, what I may call part one, during the colonial period, and role of Lagos since independence. And then finally, the very, very provocative uh, section I, I titled what is to be done and i think those who are engaged in the in in in, in debates in political theory and social theory will know the the the, 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 the paternity of the word what is to be done because it's a revolutionary revolutionary call by learning you know and you say things that people don't want to say for various reasons, but you, you say it like it is. Now, my message is actually in three parts. The first one is that I've taken a quotation from an, an old friend of mine, a Rose Scholar in, in Oxford, son of a Futua man and son of an Ugomosho woman. And he later became the deputy, the Africa deputy director of the Millennium, Millennium Campaign and died tragically on his way to the airport in Nairobi where he was based, going for an event in, uh, in Rwanda, Kigali. Targeting will always say, don't agonize, organize. Don't agonize, organize. And I think we tend a lot to agonize. Those of us who have come from it, we tend to agonize, but we don't organize. So I think we need to go beyond this colloquium 
to start organizing and do very little of agonizing. My second is that we should, by all means and at all times, on, 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 uphold what I call and what Shoko also has called the defining cosmopolitan nature of Isaleko. But we should do so in a way or by way of not joining ethnic jingoists, ethnic who will use the ethnic factor to divide. As if it is already the ethnic factor is the only is the only identity that, that we have as people of the Sahel mm -hmm. We have other defining characteristics which we should define, and because sometimes we are misguided, we look at others, some others as our enemy, and those who are actually part of us, those in fact are the enemies we should worry more about than the non. Uh, the ones we are, we are familiar with. Or whether Lagos should be part of the Western region or not, rises precisely from that. Because, but for the fact that the Northern region and the Eastern region fought hard with people like Elijah Okunu and Dr. Lewis and others, you will not have gotten Lagos back from the Western region. And there was a reason why the Western region wanted to keep Lagos. And that still goes on today. Because all this talk of regionalism, we should be careful. As a young boy, I remember traveling, and I've told this to, to just very few people, traveling to Ibadan for a scholarship in 65 to go to Oxford to go and study PPE. I went to Ilefe. The secretary of the board, whose husband was a leading politician, Bodhi Thomas, told them briefly that, let Jinodu go back to Lagos He's not one of us. We cannot give him scholarship. But the point to make from that is that, you see, in those days, those from the Eastern region, those from the Western region, those from the Northern region had multiple access to scholarships. They could get from their region, they could get from the federal government. But those of us in Lagos, only the federal government, the Admission to Oxford came after the federal scholarship had been done, had been, had, had been finished. And then Fanny Fanny they said I should go to, to Ibadan, so that, that they still accepting applications. And I went to Ibadan. Then when I came back and I told Fanny what happened, he called, he called Akinjide, who was then the Minister of Education. And he said, what? You come tomorrow morning for an interview. We have just started a special area award for Lagos because of this kind of injustice. You, you only can only apply to one place and then they are being denied that are not one of them. In the relic of the, from the 1951-54 period, when Lagos said to stay, when we said, get the way go well. And I was one of the first three to get that Lagos special area award to go and study out for. So the point I'm making is that we should be careful about people who manipulate ethnicity for their own ends. They, are, they may not be our friends, they may be our friends. And those they regard as our enemies and may not be our enemies. So I realize the second point I want to make. We should keep, because what is important about that cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitan nature of Lagos, is that that is the mirror that Nigeria should be like. Mm -hmm. Because of that, you know, every 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 instrument can be misused or can be used well. Well, we tend to focus more on the misuse than on its, its, its use or the misuse. So we cannot just abandon it because it is not working well or it's not working well for us. We should look beyond that and see what are its potential. And I think that is what we should focus upon. And on all the hate speech we are witnessing during the last election. All the expert is the result of this kind of parochialism, which is very much an affair, uh, 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 against the cosmopolitan, the inherent cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan nature of leaders. The third point I want to make message: please don't let us be afraid of asking questions. 
or even of those in authority. We must stand up to them. When we see that our own rights are being violated, we are suffering because we are not standing up. We are not standing up to political authorities. And we are not asking questions the way we should ask. And I'll come back to that later. My last point is that the litmus test, the litmus test of any public policy that we should use is, is it directed towards the public interest to reflect the human development and security of our people in general as envisioned in chapter two of our constitution? So that is the message that I want to pass forward in this, in this presentation, and I will elaborate briefly on it at the end. The role of Lagos in Nigerian history, let me say that I follow Shoko by saying that in, in, in using the term Lagos, I understand by it and use it to refer to Lagos Island which I, I say include is Aleko, Olo, Bowo, Kokwa, Guda, Okeani, Olu, Wole, Duma, Tai, Pete, Do, Itafaji, Dita, Akpapa, Obalebe, Ikui, and Victoria Island, and maybe Lagos mainland. But I am not referring to Lagos states made up of the five divisions given this acronym of Ibile, you know, Ikeja, but I agree, uh, Ikeja. So, so you could do Lagos and Ekwedo. Now, and I think the role of Lagos in our history re re revolves around three tripods. One is magnetic-like appeal captured by the aphorisms. And, and, both of, of which I take to mean that Lagos is a land of opportunities. And that is why it keeps attracting people. Why we have so much unrestricted, you know, massive influx of migration into Lagos, unlike other parts of the country. The first tripod is the location of Lagos on the Atlantic coast, and at least for the southern part of, the, of what became Nigeria, the major entry points alongside perhaps Calabar for colonial rule and the subsequent interface of Nigeria with the external world. Two, the second tripod is, I've talked about that, the cosmopolitan intellectual and cultural life that Lagos has nurtured and must keep nurturing, building on its rich ethno-communal and religious diversity. Two important elements in the composition of this tripod must be emphasized, namely, the contribution of some from among the traditional rulers, traditional chiefs, and the rising indigenous intelligentsia to oppose colonial rule. And a good example is the, the, the Eleko case between uh, Herbert Macaulay on the one hand and, and, uh, and, and Dosumo on the other hand. Imagines, the imagine of this of traditional rulership and the intellectual life is very, very important. In fact, Lagos served as a crucible where the idea of Nigeria was forged, demonstrating by its cosmo cosmopolitan and urban nature and the richly te textured tapestry of its ethno-communal and religious mosaic, the strength as well as the weakness of the oxymoron that still underlies the idea of Nigeria, unity in diversity. We tend to be focusing more on the diversity than, than on the unity, and I think we need to the trace our steps and not be part of that uh, group that wants to see Nigeria. The third tripod is the role of Lagos as the emergent indigenous of, of an emergent indigenous pretty bourgeois middle class, providing a link between Nigeria and the wider world, helping to lay the foundations for the role of Lagos as the intellectual heartland of Nigeria and for the professionalization of, the, of intellectual life. Lawyers, law, medicine, and accountancy. The first Nigerians 
to emerge from this profession, to, to embrace these professions, we are Lagosians, we are people from Isaliku, in fact. An, impact, an important element in this is all of this third private, third private. If the debate, the delicate debate that we already alluded, alluded to between 19, 19, 1950 and 1954, over the place of Lagos in the evolving trend from regionalism to federalism during the period, resulting in the merger of Lagos with the Western region under the 51 constitution and the reversal of Lagos to federal territory under the 1954 And Venezuela. And as a footnote to what Shupo said and what I've discussed, discussed several times with Alai Gokuno, we need to remember that Lagos was the colony. The others, the northern region, the eastern region, the western, we are protectorate of England. I think we do, we, because we have not been studying this, I think it's important to, to bear this. And that means a lot in terms of the status of Lagos. Lagos people of Lagos carried British passports. And they had citizenship rights with, 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 with citizens of, of Great Britain. So I think it's important to, to, to get that. So that the fight 51 and 54 is really over the status of Lagos, you know, uh, yeah, in terms of it's, it's, it's being separate from the, from the protectorate. And therefore, you cannot manage it with, with the protectorate, which is what I think Abadine Jadili was talking about. What, the position of Lagos changed in 1967 with this the creation of Lagos states in the, in the reconfiguration of Nigeria, Nigeria's first state federal structure. Then the Midwest, uh, West, East, and North into its 12 state structure, where Lagos, along with other minority groups, and that is important, Lagos, along with other minority groups, we are given states of their own in what was essentially not a federal system based on geographical diversity, but on ethnic diversity, granting minor, granting people, granting ethnic groups some level of autonomy within their homelands. And that created, of course, what we refer to in the literature as differentiated citizenship. You are citizen of the which is now being defined along ethnic lines and citizen of Nigeria. So you have that conflict between chapter two and chapter four, the conflict between the rights of indigenous people to some level of autonomy within their own homelands and the rights of Nigerians anywhere to travel anywhere, maybe anywhere in the country. That problem is of course, is of course not new to Nigeria. It's, it's, it's new to many ethnic federalisms, particularly talk of Canada, uh, India in particular and Pakistan. And even in the US, you see that, that you have state citizenship and national citizenship. In many states in the US, you cannot claim citizenship rights at the state level unless you have lived there for X number of years. You are treated as a non-resident, as a non-citizen of that state. So even in a place like the US, which is based on geographical diversity, you still have this Notion that this, these two citizenship. And that is also why you have two sets of laws. And each, each law acting with direct impact on people living in those territories. So we are bound by the laws of Lagos and we are bound by the laws of Nigeria. So that is, that is this whole question of divided sovereignty, divided citizenship. But in the case of ethnic federalism like our own, it is, it is, it is especially reserved for indigenous people of that state, ethnic, ethnic group in that state. And that is the reason is because, and, and, and that is why in many places, in particularly 
even in India, there is always migration from poor areas to rich areas, states that are poor from to states that are rich. And what the Indians have done is was even to, to permanently resist because they know that influx of migrants from other parts of the country will virtually kill, kill the indigenous them into minorities in their own homelands, which is supposed to serve their interests. So it's an enduring problem of federalism. And it all depends on how you manage it. How they manage it in India is in some states in India, you may require a 15 years residency requirement, showing that you actually resided in that state and you pay your taxes. But whereas in our own situation here, until recently, people go back home to name their children, they go back home to be buried, they go back home to build their houses, they go back to even to register their motorcycles and their vehicles. And you can also know A, a problem is universal in all federal ethnic federal systems, you know, and there are different solutions. But we have not, and, and what makes it more problematic in our case, I was once at a meeting with uh, a chairman of the Nigeria Bar Association, Agakuba, I can mention him, and he was talking about how. In Lagos, his children cannot go to school. They have to pay special fee. And I said, Ulisa, when I was in the Electoral Commission, three judges, retired judges, one from the Supreme Court, one from the uh, from the Court of Appeal, came to meet Emi and, and and the rest of the members in INEC and said, over a dead boy and Rumataman cannot be the chairman of Ulisa, local government council. Who are mainly non Ulicha people. And of course, at our, we said, yeah, sorry, you cannot come and preach that to us here. So I told him that. So the other aspect of course is that there is also no reciprocity, no mutuality, no more, 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 more. When they assert their own rights as Nigerians in Lagos, they will not allow you to assert it in a place. In, in that, that is, that you have, if you're not from there, they say go back to your home. So they claim it, it's convenient for them to claim it here, but they, they deny it to you or do not fight for it in the other side. We know of many, many Omwe Kos working in Ogu State who have been denied permanent secretaryship because they are not from Ogu State. They say go back to your state. And when you look at Lagos State, cabinet, Civil service, parents, there are many of them there who are all So I'm just giving this to something near us that it is not between us and non Yorubas. It is something that is universal, that is city. And, and it is because there is no mutuality, there is no reciprocity. So if we can do that, then that, that can be helpful. The second is the continuing brick back, brick back over federalism. Federal Lagos relations. You know, that Shagari, it was between uh, Jack Conley and the federal government. And two, two people from Lagos State, Jack Conley on one hand, Josumo uh, uh, on the other hand, over housing in Lagos. You know, now we have a party in power at the federal level and a party in power. Lagos State is still suffering in terms of federal attention. So we need to think carefully and see what is the fundamental problem. Because if you want to move ahead and solve the problem, you must understand the nature of the problem. You know, so it's not just a question of somebody gets up in the in the house of in the national in the Senate. Uh, I want to a bill, a bill to create special something for Lagos. No, you, you don't do you must do some groundwork before you start. That is just speaking to the to the to the to, to the to the gallery. I've even I've even consulted with Lagosians 
with people in Lagos Island about what and what they want and where we can do about it. That is what is missing. There is no consultation. And I'll come to that. There is no consultation. There is no participation. Somebody just sits there, just to the gallery, you know, and they, 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 they say this. The third problem facing us is what I describe as the massive problem of the structural condition of Lagos in the face of, unrest of, of un unrestricted, uh, of, of unrestricted migration and, a, and, and the criminal, criminalization of politics in the states. Politics has been criminalized in these states. And we sit down, we don't talk about it. And our paternity is being stored up, you know, away. So that is, that is, that's the other point. I go to this Aleko regularly. I've not gone since the, 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 the pandemic started. I, 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 but if you go to, I weep what I see there. What I see, it's a, it's a slum in the center of Lagos. It's a slum. And it's not just, that's not just the only slum. There are many slums around Lagos, Makoko, Maroc, all those other, even in Ikori here, there are, there are still slums. So those are issues that we, we should take. So what is to be done? So I go back to my what I said at the beginning, namely, and it's a framework. It's not elaborate, I must warn. It's not elaborate. But that is the work that Salivo de Senators Unions have to do. We must really sit down and look forward. Don't let us look, we look backward to know where we are coming from, but we must look forward to see what can we do. Let us stop agonizing. And the first thing I think going back is don't agonize, organize. Let's have a conversation, systematic conversation to define the nature of the challenges facing us. Think through them, prioritize them, and map out sustainable strategies to addressing them. I think this is one important task that we need to do. We must start organizing, start planning, and start all this uh, talk about, about complaining all the time. Two, let's uphold the uh, defining cosmopolitan, cosmopolitanism of Lagos. Let's think less about the limitations of cosmopolitanism and more about using it for a greater Lagos that opens the mirror of what Nigeria should be to the rest of the country. Let us ask questions from political authorities because sovereign power under section 14.2, subsections A to C of our constitution lies with us. And I'm quoting from that constitution. Simply, A, sovereignty belongs to the people of Nigeria from whom government through this constitution derives all its authority and power. Two, B, the security and welfare of the people shall be the primary purpose of government. The participation of people by the people in their government shall be ensured by in accordance with the provisions of this constitution. It is clear. So we, we must hold them accountable. We must hold them to standards of transparency and ethics in pursuit of the public policies. And if we keep asking questions, and the question to ask is not to define the national question in ethnic terms, but define the national question in terms of bridging the gap between the wealthy and the poor. So we must, we must, we must inject a missing link into demand for restructuring. Let us bring back a viral semi-autonomous local government. Let us reset our satellite from focus on Alausa and direct is go and direct his governance and, and direct the governance of in the lake to, in the, to the Lagos Island of old is Aleku, Olobu, Papua, Guja, Upper Lindi, Apapa, Lagos mainland. As they as they say, small is beautiful. But what the political class are doing is to keep on this talk of restructuring, they want to give more power to the state. It is here in Lagos that we all sat down like mumus when they got the powers of the local governments through surreptitious sort of means. They all the chairmen have given up their power to the state government. That is even unconstitutional. 
And then you have what I will call <laughs> phantom, phantom, phantom referendums. Uh, the people met in Nepal, they are, they live around here, that we have voted to create, to, to, to see our power to, 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 to allow us. And we all sat down. Even the opposition party all sat down. That open, open, open slavery that was done in the daylight. And we all sat down like, because we are afraid to talk. If we don't talk, what are we going to leave for our children? If we don't talk, what we are doing here today is just useless. And the, the, the more it takes us to talk, the more difficult we are creating for our children and our grandchildren. But because it's very, very difficult to reverse the situation. As, as it is, it's difficult to reverse, but we can reverse it by mounting pressure. And there are ways of organizing that you can do it. You don't have to be in government. You don't have to ask for government. So, so the questions we should ask, for example, who owns, who owns, who owns, or to whom as a co-Atlantic are patrimony being granted? And for how long, on what conditions? We are afraid to ask those questions. What is happening in Lubiri and at the Oroshoki end? of Lagos Third Mainland Bridge. What is happening there? What is happening? We have the House of Assembly, and that is the problem when you have a one party ruling a state. They, they get complacent, they get, you know. So, but unfortunately, Lagos State is a one party state. So the National Assembly, the State Assembly cannot, and most states, that's why most states cannot even stand up to the executive governor, so-called executive governor, because there's no word like executive in the constitution. The governor is the governor. Don't put the name executive as he is authoritarian or is all powerful. Is bound by, by, by uh, checks and balances are there. So that is the message. Please let us speak the truth to power because it is in our interest to do so. Going back to chapter two of our constitution. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Um, pertinent questions um, that I hope that we have um, taken note of. Um, the key thing there is we shouldn't um, waste our time agonizing we should be asking questions and we should be organizing and we should be telling ourselves one another the truth whether it be sweet whether it be bitter we should be able to tell ourselves the truth thank you very much sir okay next we're going to have dr taibat Lawanson, who's been um, listening in um, patiently. Um, so, technology, this is where you kick in. Okay, there she is. Now I can um, move out of your face and we'll hear what she has to contribute. Thank you. Welcome. All right, thank you very much for having me. I stand on the existing protocol and um, coming behind the two very passionate charges that have gone forth, I find myself in a bit of a tight spot. And so I will share some reflections. Yeah, I will share some reflections from my perspective as an urban planner. So Lagos, Isaleko, Lagos Island has grown. Lagos as a city has grown from about 60,000 people in 1872 to 763,000 in 1960. As of today, there are over 23 million people in the city. And so the city is a victim of its own 
hospitality, hospitable nature, you know, permitting or allowing people to come in. The migration that has um, improved or fostered enterprise around the city, we may have just become um, victims of it. And one of the ways that we have done that that has happened is the challenge of modernism. And so we're losing our identity because Lagos, to all intents and all purposes, is a cosmopolitan, but it is also very indigenous and it is a historic city. The uniqueness the unique and identity of the city of the is lost due to, due to modernity and the and cost the, of becoming a world-class city. And if we, and if we deep dive into deep Lagos Island, we're losing we're our lo markets to malls. We're losing our iconic built environment heritage to shiny glass buildings that have no stories to tell. And um, uh, the generations unborn will not have an affinity to downtown Lagos, to Lagos Island, if they cannot point to those houses that tell the story of where we're coming from. Unfortunately, in the most recent past, in the last month or so, there has also been an attack on some of the few existing um, built heritage, built environment heritage. The other thing also has to do with us. We must take personal responsibilities. In building some of our houses, developers we invite, Lagos Island actually has the highest rate of building collapse in the entire country. And that has nothing to do with government. That has to do with the individual decisions that we're taking by, you know, with who we engage to rebuild our homes, our family houses. And so while it is important for us to organize rather than agonize, it's also important for us to take responsibility to the rebuilding and the rede redevelopment of our homes, of our family steads. And so while the government is interested in building these malls that have nothing, you know, that do not reflect our heritage, and in doing and so, some Trying to this market are going, the historical the importance of these places are going. It's important it's for us to rise up to speak up. Speak up. Yeah. 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 All of us are complicit in enabling yeah. these in the all on the altar of modernism. We want to build a world class city. But when but we when build we a world class city that has that no has, um, um, historic imprint. Then people then can people come out and say that Lagos is a no man's land. And that's a challenge I have for all of us today. If we're going to stand as Omoiko, we must take responsibility to do the right thing, to agitate. And when we're speaking the truth to power, we must come with clean hands by taking the right decisions, ensuring that within our personal families, we are ensuring that things are done properly. The other thing that I want to talk about is the preservation of our culture and, and the preservation of our norms, our music, our, um, our food, you know, and the, the, you know, amplifying what Lagos Island is. Many of our children don't go to Lagos Island anymore because it is unsafe. And why is it unsafe? because we have not you know, taken power, we have not taken ownership of that space. Many of us moved out into Lagos, into Greater Lagos, and only look back maybe on New Year's Day for Fanti or things like that. And so my charge is that um, it's time to take personal responsibility. The built environment is what we see. It's not enough for you to say that you're you're from Isaleko or you're a, you know, a Lagosian or an Omoeko, you must be able to point. We still point to Buckingham Palace. We still point you know, to the Westminster Abbey and places like that. How do we preserve this built environment you know, that we have? How do we preserve this heritage that we have? How do we ensure that the streets of Lagos in 200 years, when our generations on bond will walk in those streets, they will be proud 
of their, you know, indig of their indig indigenous um, status. And I think that is the challenge we have to take on board alongside the other um, challenges that have been already put forward concerning, you know, the, the power structures, the governance structures and all of that. We have to ensure, we have to insist, and we have to stand, you know, in a position where we are able to preserve our built heritage, we are able to push, you know, the indigenous um, the, the indigen, um, agenda from a position of strength that will benefit our generations of born. The other thing that I want to talk about is this issue of Lagos as a no man's land. And it boils down to the contestations for power and for economic resources. Professor Ginodu has made quite some allusions to that. And I think in the very recent past, it's something we need to take very seriously. And it is also the reason why these buildings are going down. Because if the buildings go down, then there's, a, there's an opportunity to rewrite history. There's an opportunity to rewrite history from where they start or from where their interests are covered. And so while the um, issues are about indigenship, where there are not so many of us, the more important thing is that it is a contestation for power, the contestation for economic resources, and so we have to be intentional about the decisions we make, and we have to be strategic right. about the about the of our heritage. heritage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Taibat um, Lawanson. Um, short and sweet and straight to the point. Um, there's something very close to my heart um, as well, the disappearance of our ancestral homes. You know, my grandfather's house has been replaced by a shopping plaza, a shopping mall. And I know my father fought tooth and nail for years before he passed on. And after he passed on, they probably went um, other people as prepared to carry on the fight. It is um, a shopping mall. And we still haven't seen the promised two bedroom flats in some strange place. I think it was at your ball or something they said. And I'm thinking, well, why are you moving us from here to your ball? Did we tell you we don't like this place? But that's the way it is. A lot of questions that we need to start taking seriously. We need to stop agonizing, start organizing, and asking the right questions. Asking the right questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, we will go to, I hope, could you check for me that uh, Memeka is on? He, he sent a message that he was having a problem with his, um, internet connectivity so he was going to log off and log back in so while he does that we will have um billy kiss um we cyclists i still think we, uh, <laughs> okay thank you director general lashrab and lashrab is the lagos state Records and Archives Bureau. Good evening, everyone. Please permit me to stand on existing protocol. It's been really interesting to listen to the various presentations by my predecessors and my seniors. I'm very happy to be here. Um, it's, you know, even though you, you, know, you read so much about uh, Lagos history, you always learn something new every day. So Lagos State Records and Archives Bureau, LASRA, was established in 2007, 2008, uh, during the Fashala administration, of which Mr. Shashwari was a member of the cabinet. Um, and it was a public sector reform, um, and it's focused on ensuring that all Lagos State records are kept properly. So all the records of all the ministries, departments,
agencies of Lagos State, including local governments and all arms of government are under the control of last run. We're also responsible for documenting and keeping the Lagos history and heritage. And so that's the cap that I'm wearing today. Um, so the job of last run is to document the rich culture of the whole of Lagos and, you know, of course, of Isaleko as well. Um, we document customs, traditions, we collect physical artifacts, we interview people, we document information about the religion, the various religions that are available, oral history, ancient historical sites, and many other things. Uh, some of the initiatives that we have, um, we, we, we acqu we've gone a lot all over the world to acquire archival material. Um, we are currently digitizing um, Last Rams holdings. And we're also um, working on naming various locations in Lagos to showcase because a lot of the, you know, the historical names that we had in Lagos are lost. And we also would like to document historic buildings in Lagos. There's actually a law on the books um, that protects historic buildings. Um, if it's recognized by the Lagos state government, those buildings cannot be demolished. And we also public, uh, publish historical books on Lagos. Um, one of the things that we struggle with at last round is the big gap with regard to the availability of archival information. A lot of the information that is available on Lagos can only be found in faraway places like Britain, Portugal, Brazil, amongst others. I can tell you of the number of times people come to us to ask questions. We do have some information, but much of the information is in the hands of people in other countries. So we are focused on collecting this information and we have organized trips to these various places. We have also worked to showcase a lot of the Lagos heritage via various programs like Lagos Day, Lagos Heritage Series, the Living Legends program, and so on. And as a proud Lagosian, not only by taxation, but by origination, I'm very proud of the rich history of Lagos. And I'm very interested in documenting our history because we do have a lot of history. You know, we, a lot of people have said that today, that people think that Lagos is a no man's land, which is definitely wrong. There is a lot of cultural history that Lagos has. Um, I want to congratulate the Saleco Descendants Union for their great strides. And I want to challenge you all to work on documenting our history. Um, please don't leave it to the government alone to do it. We need you, we need to work with you to do this. You can collect important archival information. We struggle to convince people to give us their, their books, their records, their pictures. And it, I can't tell you the number of times that we, you know, we talk to people, older people, that have a lot of valuable information that maybe they don't feel comfortable giving to us. And then we hear later on, oh, this person passed away. And then of course, the, the holdings are gone forever. So I, I want to let you know that we have purpose-built archives in Last Rap, where we keep all these records, they are safely kept, and it will be available for everybody to research and to reference. Uh, most importantly, for our children, you know, it's very difficult, and a lot of our children do not know the, their history. And it's on us, the onus is on us to document and share this history for them. So please see LASRA as a resource and a willing partner in this regard. Um, I'm not going to bore you too much, but I want, in conclusion, I would like to call on the Saleco Descendants Union to partner with LASRA. Let's work together to document the rich history of Isaleiko, please. You know, we will be very, very pleased and happy to have um, you know, the opportunity to interview your members, to work with you of, of Isaleiko, so that it can be shared. We have people that come from all over the world to come and learn about the information, and they really don't know where to go. So if you can, you know, work with LASRA, to collect this information and, document, and deposit it at the last wraps archives, this information will be available to everyone. And as we know, and, I, and I've learned from my readings, the people that write the history are the ones that will determine how it is told. So if you leave it on other people, outsiders, to tell your history, tell our history, it's definitely not going to be, the, it's not going to serve us. So I want to call on us to please see it as a responsibility for us to tell our history so that it will serve us. Because these are things that are very important, most especially in the future, you know, for whatever reason. The history needs to be documented properly. You know, I cannot stress this enough. 
And I would also want to say that Isaleko is a very important heritage location. A lot of us travel all over the world. We spend so much money to visit many places and see you know, all the historical information. But right there, less than you know, four kilometers, five kilometers away from us, we have a world-class heritage site. If well-positioned, well-packaged, can rival any of these places all over the world. So I'd like to challenge Selecto Business Union. I know we have a lot of work to do. I've said a lot of things, but please, this is something that is very near and dear to me, and I think we can do this. Thank you so much. I'm very honored to, to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And um, let me just add, um, for the last two years, I think we've done it for two years running, on the last Sunday of, we take a walk around East Haleko and we go through all the little um, lanes, the little alleys, and it's, um, it's always interesting and we will do more. And thank you for that charge. So thank you very much. So now you know there's last wrap there. So if you have any um, things that um, could be of use, um, I'm sure that um, Bilthis will be willing, willing to have you, or well, to come out to you or to have them and document them so that they're there available for everybody to use. Finally, I understand that Ed is waiting. Okay, so I'll um, step aside and Ed will listen to what Ed Kazo has to contribute. And then we'll go into questions. Hello, um, I don't know if you can hear me now. Yes. yes. You can hear me. Okay. Thank you very much. I was, I was, I was on mute, and unfortunately, I, I couldn't control that. Thank, first of all, thank you very much for having me. It, it is a pleasure to speak uh, to this audience. I'm sorry I cannot be with you. I'm, I've been a little bit unwell, and uh, that's one of the reasons why my uh, video is not on. Uh, I do not think I should present myself to an august audience with my present uh, demeanor. Um, well, I uh, thank you for the invitation is, is greatly appreciated because my association with Lagos, as you can tell from my name, um, you can tell that probably my origins uh, differ slightly from the Saleku uh, 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 um, uh, Aboriginal uh, platform. Um, but I will, I will speak, thank you so much. I will, I, will, I will speak to my experience, both as an historian as, and also as a lover of Lagos. My family's association with Lagos goes back close to uh, uh, 92 years. Uh, my father, my grandfather was a policeman um, who uh, he was a police officer who was uh, trained in Lagos and became, lived, you know, off and on in Lagos throughout his life. My father was born in Lagos in Isaleko, to be precise, um, grew up in Lagos. Um, you know, I grew up here. I went to school here. I went to school at St. Mary's just by I Campus Square in Gregory's College. So, my mother worked, we, uh, even when we moved out of Lagos briefly, we moved back in 1968. Some of my greatest and best memories of the city that I grew to love and I still love till today. The, the, the people, the sounds, the smells, they formed my earlier socialization as a human being. Um, as an historian, my, a lot of my work, a lot of my scholarship has been around the social history, landmarks in the social history of Nigeria. And it so happens that the the inevitable starting point for a lot of conversations is starts to start with Lagos. It's not. Uh, it's not. Uh, you know. Uh, it's just, just the way it is. And I, I was actually going to deliver a different talk from what I'm going to take because I haven't listened to the speakers before me. I think it is necessary for me to take a different tack and reflect something of a deviation from because I, as I said, I come as a guest of this gathering, even though I am. I consider myself to be very proud. Uh, Lagosian, a big fan of Lagos a, a, and a co-file, as I say, what is necessary for me to at least reflect, provide something of a, a deviation from the tone that has been set before this, which I, I have to speak to in all honesty. Um, 
Lagos has always led the way. There's no, there's no question. I mean, two of the things, I was, two of the talking points I was going to use, data points I was going to use, were the 1908 People's Union meeting at Enowa, you know, in which the very first political association in Nigeria came together. Uh, essentially, put, you know, people just came together protesting against the water rates introduced by the colonial uh, uh, government. And from there, political activity in Nigeria was birthed. The second event I was going to talk about was the gathering of Nigerians at, upon the return of Michael Imodu from detention in 1945 at the beginning of the national strike. Um, you know, I was also going to talk about uh, Madame Pelewura's protests against the pulling regulations on, uh, uh, on food prices during, uh, the end of, towards the end of sec the Second World War. All these point to the fact that Lagos really has been the triggering point for social change nationally. Now, I, I, that becomes a little bit intuitive, a little bit uh, sterile when you consider the very passionate presentations that have been made. And I think I'm uniquely placed as somebody who falls into the cracks of this conversation to say, to give some perspectives on this. Um, what I would say is that Lagos, some of the, the, the modern day strength of Lagos has always has definitely been as a result of migration, as a result of population, as, long as, as a result of the pulling of the strengths of different peoples from all over the country, from all over the world. That has been the greatness of Lagos. However, I think it would be churlish, it would be, it would be absurd for me to simply sit down and say, well, you, that no man's land paradigm is something I've always disagreed with. There is no such thing as a no man's land. Lagos had an indigenous population, has, a, has an indigenous uh, population going back long before the colonial uh, 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 infrastructures were in place. I have taken time to study the traditions of Lagos, its kingships, I can't, you know, its cultures, its traditions, even as someone whose uh, uh, grandfather was born in Igbo land. My grandfather was socialized in Lagos. He married a Yoruba woman. My grandfather was you know, a member of social clubs in Lagos. My grandfather spoke Yoruba fluently. My grandfather was part of Lagos society. He was accepted into Lagos society. But for him, one of the most important things was to respect the institutions which he met here, respect the cultural institution. In fact, his acceptance was based on the fact that he came with respect for the institutions that existed. He came with an understanding that he was welcomed as a guest. He immersed himself in it. Of course, you know your limits. You know, he immersed himself in it, but he also knew the boundaries that existed based on the cultural paradigms. Now, my father, my, my father and his siblings grew up in Uluogbo, where they were born, uh, where most of them were born. They were members, you know, my, my father and my, his junior brothers were members of a club called the Olubo Cowboys, which some older members of the audience will probably know. You know, they spoke Yoruba before they spoke English. They learned Igbo many years later. As far as they were concerned, this was, they were part of this place. They were part of this city, you know, and they, the pulling of strengths was what, is what I think gives it its strength. But the thing is, none of us can pretend that there has not been, in the, you know, the expression of migration, first of all, you know, the, the, the epochs have been, I mean, uh, Dr. Lawson gave some very interesting uh, a, a data on the, uh, the impact uh, uh, of migration from 1872. When we look at today, I mean, we, uh, the post-Civil War explosion in migration is something that definitely changed the character of Lagos. And almost, I mean, uh, 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 His you Excellency, Hello? Sorry? Sorry? Hello? 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 Sorry, there's, there's, somebody, there's somebody talking over me. Is there, is there, is there a problem? <laughs> Okay, I'll just carry on. Okay, um, the, the post-war era saw, saw an explosion of, ex, of for the population of Lagos, which almost caused an uh, 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 almost permanent lasting change. But then nothing more, nothing as telling as what I saw when I returned from my travels in England in 2012, and I saw the market change in the character of the city, in the, both in the demographics, in the, in the nature of the city itself, the nature of, the, of Lagos itself. Because we're talking about, we have a very, it's a, Lagos is a very defined uh, uh, geographical, geographical limit. And I saw an irre irreversible change, which even as someone who answers a name that is Igbo, Igbo and not uh, Yoruba or Lagosian, it broke my heart. My wife, family where uh, I come from Adini Jadili. My wife comes from the, uh, is, is, you know, her father is from the Eshe local family. And having, we, it broke my heart to see what had happened to the heart of Lagos. And it's not simply a question of saying, I think it's simplistic to simply say, well, the non-indigenous influence caused this. The reality is that 
this was a situation that happened because it was not managed properly. Whether we like it or not, urban centers will always experience a change in its ethnic, a change in its demographics, in its, in its character, which will sometimes cause fractures. Even I can use London as an example because you can even twin London with with Lagos in the sense that London had an indigenous population, you know, the Cockneys, who effectively were impacted in most in almost similar terms by the slum clearances in Lagos in the night, late 1960s. Uh, uh, it happened in London with the Cockneys in the, the at the end of the, uh, the, the during the Second World War and, and in the, the post Second World War era. So London lost his character in the same way that Lagos lost his character. Now, I will end my presentation because as I said, what I had planned to say is not what I'm saying now because I had to reflect the, the current mood. Is that, yes, I even I as a man who was not, uh, uh, whose origins differ from the Sareko descendants, I can say that I'm also emotionally impacted by the changes that have happened because the love that many of us have for Lagos was based on memories, based on an understanding which, for me, you know, it's very recent in the grand scheme of things, 52 years, my first experience in Lagos. But as it, things that have happened that you cannot simply blame the, uh, uh, the settlers for, there has to be some ownership by the success, succeeding generations that acquiesced to this. And, and I can't even, you can't even blame yourself totally because at the end of the day, organization uh, development, as they say, has its negative side effects. The way forward, well, all I can say is I will accede to uh, Professor Genotti's very erudite uh, 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 submissions because he goes into a lot of detail about the bricks and, uh, the bricks and mortar and the nuts and bolts of mortar. the re-engineering of, of, uh, 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 of the problem, as it were. But then that does not necessarily mean that you simply shut people out. It simply means you manage the method, manage one, the preservation of your heritage. You manage the preservation of your cultural mores and platforms. You manage the, you, you highlight the character, the essential character of your people. Jealously guard them. You know, mistakes have been made in the past that can be corrected, but you may not be corrected in this generation. But what I will certainly say is that people like me who love this city, who love this land, who do not necessarily have to be enemies. Yes, we do. We are not enemies of Lagos. We, are, we can be partners, but then there has to be a change. I agree with you, and that is my point, you know. And uh, please, all, all we ask for is that this change happen in a manner that is organic, in a manner that is peaceful, and in a manner that is, is proactive and respectful, for, respectful of, of all interests, but it has to happen. And I thank you for having me here. It, it is a privilege and, uh, you know, long may your uh, association uh, last and long may your, uh, uh, your objectives be met. I mean, may your objectives be met. You know, thank you very much. I can't even hear anything, man. I can't hear anything. Man. My son seems to have... Uh, uh, we shouldn't actually ask, ask him, no, no, we shouldn't let him ask the question yet. Hold on. Let's ask from the audience because they might be asking him a question about what he said. Okay. So the young man directly in front of me, that rule, no, that rule, that rule, come back. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening, sirs and Maz. Please introduce yourself. Uh, Thank you. My name is Ayo Daily Adio. I edit the Avalon Daily, an online 
news analysis platform. Um, one of the things that has, you know, a common thread with all of the panelists was the fact that Lagosians had to organize and, and stop um, agonizing. And, I, and I'm asking what Lagosians are going to organize. Um, what is the common uh, compelling vision that Lagosians are going to organize behind? Does Lagos um, want to be the shipping hub of West Africa, which Lome has knocked it off the scene? Does it want to be the financial hub of West Africa? Um, does it want to be the innovation and entrepreneurship hub, which I believe will determine how it positions itself to demand, uh, whether it's from the federal government or how it organizes itself um, to demand better. So what exactly would Lagos be organizing itself behind? Uh, and how is it going to move that agenda um, forward? Thank you. I, I, okay. Okay. I, I, I think I know who that question should go to. <laughs> No, somebody came up with that, um, stop agonizing, organize. So <laughs> he will explain. And then the others can add to it. Yes, thank you. Introduce yourself, please. Uh, my name is uh, Hakeem Adini Good evening. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you for an insightful um, symposium. So my question is for Professor Adele Um So you rightly alluded that the salient um, features of federalism um, include the existence of dual government at the central and state level. Now, what do you suggest we do to control migration? I'm a believer in migration. I believe that is what actually makes Lagos. And migration itself. And um, the second one is what I call legal usurpers, taking positions that qualified indigents are denied. What do you think we can really do about that? Second question. Um, legal usurpers. Legal usurpers. What I call legal usurpers. What he calls legal usurpers. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, do you want to do this those, those questions? For the, for the first question. Yeah, I didn't know this. I guess. You know, so you see, ideas are very, very complex. So when you say don't organize, how do you go about doing that? So I suggested. Okay. To continue this discussion among ourselves, let's pick up all ideas, let's see what, from people's experiences, what do we need to do? Then that will give us the way forward, you know? And, and as you are moving ahead, other things come up that you need to do. But definitely in a system such as we have now, you see, uh, the, the language of hate, is self-defeating. It's self-defeating because in the first place, you are debasing yourself and, and you're also debasing the others and the others are going to take a confrontational attitude against you. So we need to find a way. I don't have the answer, but I've thrown the idea out. I don't have uh, but I, the, the, the challenge I've thrown to the Senders Union is let them, if they accept this, they don't have to have, if they accept it, then how do they go about it? Then that may be for other people who have experience, who have competence in that area. Yes, we have brought this idea. This is how we do it. You know, it's like the, 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 the physicist who can just have the concept of, uh, you know, a, a bridge or something like that. But then there are, there are bridge builders. The physicist is not necessarily a bridge builder, but there are bridge builders 
who will see what are the factors to take into account in building this bridge over this terrain, over that terrain. So I think we should really keep that. The, the challenge is really, not for me, it's also for but it is better for the union to find if they accept it as a good strategy, then how do we do it? And then they, they will consult other people who, who, who have more knowledge, more experience than the theoretical man. Now to a second question. Um, controlled migration. If 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 you if 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 you look at migration patterns in federal systems, you find generally it is from the poorer to the richer regions. People looking for opportunities that are not available in their own areas. Now, the way of dealing with that is in ethnic federations like Nigeria, Canada, Ethiopia, India, Pakistan, is in some cases to reduce, to, to, to water, to water the, the, blood, the blood criterion for indigenous with the residency criterion. You live in a place for 10, 15 years, and you demonstrate your commitment to that state. Then after that, you now are entitled to, to the residency requirements. The re residency requirements are still in the constitution. And then you walk towards it. If you have just migrated to that area, you walk towards it and you establish. The problem we have here, I think, is that there is no, as I said, there is no reciprocity and mutuality. You know. Secondly, we still have some kind of firm attachments to where we come from. We do living ceremonies where we are staying in, the, in our own particular way. We go back home to have weddings of our children. We go back home to bury our parents. You know, we go back home, we build houses there. We register, license our motor vehicles and bicycles and, and so on. But those things are gradually going down. Not many people are doing that now. So we are making some, 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 some progress. You know. So, but they were fortunate. They were fortunate in India. So that this was debated heavily during their constituent assembly. Very, very strong argument for 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 indigenship and very strong argument for for uh, for for non residency uh, required for for non residency requirement to enjoy benefits. But in our own here, if you see Region. So you form political parties that are ethnic and uh, political parties rose as ethnic based. Whereas in India, the United International Congress was an you know, was, 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 was it. So we have we have lived with that fact since 1950. And the separateness that we experienced under colonial rule was also a contribution to that. So I think it's it's gonna be, be difficult, but we have we have to keep faith. You know, we don't lose some, and, we keep, and I think it is, it is, it is, it is, it is it, the other aspect of it, which we have not really, I think Piazzo had men mentioned it. I've had nephews from my sisters, my sister's children. Lagos State University was, the, was saying they are not indigenous of Lagos because their parents are bearing non Yorubanians. And yet we know under the constitution that indigenous is from both the father's side and the mother's side. And yet at the same time, when they were registering people for to give them tuition fees waivers, there are Igbos and who were coming bringing letters from local saying that they are, and they know that they are 
they are not your kids are not your Roman names, but they, but this particular this particular one, they say no, they are not going to register because they are not your, your father is not from Lagos State. So I think it's so it is a struggle that we have to fight. That reminds me the other point I should have made. You see, once you once you lay out the roadmap, you must keep on. This thing is a matter of struggling. You have to struggle. You have to fight. You don't give up. And it's, it's a long haul. It's a long haul. Don't give up. Giving up. Or we don't give up. We keep agonizing and not seeing, seeing that this is a continuous battle that may go over three, four, five, six generations. And we have to, we have to start it. Like, like Mao says, the journey of a thousand miles starts with a step. So we must make that, we must start to make that step before, because the longer it takes us to do this, the more difficult. And what I also think is important is that local government needs to be revived. It's Aleppo, if, you, if you take Isalego, for example, in Lagos State, we are in competition for office for, for appointments and with Panagri, Ikorodu, Ikeja. We are in competition with them. You know, but if if we have a vibrant local government that is autonomous, semi-autonomous, then in each of these places, there will be that accountability and transparency will be more. So, we, the, the, so I think what we need to do when we fight in our various areas, let us receive the governors who want to create a totalitarian system in each state by strangling other competitive uh, com, 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 competitive uh, processes. That we must grant independence to local government because if I, mean, I go to Isaleko, I go to Olowusu Zapas, there's nothing there. You, know, you try to see the chairman, there's really nothing. You know, but if there is accountability, and then you make the price of election, you allow independence to run for public public office, then the, the, the whole question of being being uh, being uh, beclouded by by uh, a one party state that becomes arrogant because it has been in power for so long, and there's no there's no serious opposition to it. So they get arrogant; they can commit murder, and and they are arrogant for what because elections are rigged. So it's not being much because what they read so they don't have a sense of accountability. So I think basically what I want to suggest therefore is that let us start thinking small. Let us control our own local governments. We can hold our own local government chairman accountable. Oh. Yes, and uh, there was a question on legal the phrase legal usurpers. Well I, I guess well uh, legal, legal, I don't know what you mean by legal use. Those who claim to be Omiku are not Omiku. I mean you cannot have, have see that is part of the abuse of the system. They buy it, they buy it. Most of those who are bringing indigenous certificates to 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 to, to Lagos, to, to Lasso, for example. I'm sorry to say they bring them from chiefs, they bring them from council chairmen. So our gatekeepers, our gatekeepers are not acting in our own interest. They are abusing their gatekeeping role. Because they are gatekeepers to make sure that only indigenous are given certification as negotiations. Thank you very much. So I think that's the need for us to always ask questions. Um, Ms. Dasha, sorry, did you want to add something or did you want to ask a question? Oh. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, do we have um, questions that people have sent in? No, I think well, they're just happy listening. Um, they're just happy listening in. Okay. Um, I think. Um, do you have anything? Um, closing statement. Yes. I think everybody would like to wrap up as quickly as possible, so yes. I think we will uh, we'll spend the time. But I just wanted to say that um, listening to um, some of the comments, Thing that gathered around and we wrote it and said this is what it's going to be. Indigenship is 
it, it is organic. It is innate. It is a question of heritage. You can't deny it. That's why under the entire United Nations community, the entire world, came together and wrote a convention to say you cannot deny people the right to feel like indigenous. It doesn't mean that you get any material advantage, but it is the softest and most lethal power that you can ever have. People get upset when they hear uh, it's like the Scientist Union celebrating. Not because you said that they should not become governors, but because you are, they are offended because of the many years of complacency of us subsuming our indigenous to we must continue to confront Nigeria with the fact that there are people who own this heritage and they will celebrate it, come what may. It's a bigger weapon than um, citizenship. And if we think that to deal with, um, what did my, I didn't hear, did say? Legal, is to find some sort of legal framework. It's not. It is to continue to insist on who we are. It's a bigger weapon. They find it offensive. And just to say to them, like, there is no problem. You say that there's a problem. There's no problem. It's a legal designers, you know, doesn't present a problem. What we present is a solution. A solution to a people who want to be free. They want to be free to express themselves. They want to be free to be preeminent in their state. That's all. Thank you very much. I understand there's a question. Can I have it, please? Um, I'm just um, saying about the question that um, you asked the um, man from Avalon, asked the question and said, well, so how do, how do we want to organize ourselves? And um, you will soon hear a, a bit about the history of the union. But even what the union has started doing in the last two years, we have moved from just focusing on just scholarships to a wider um, range of things, our social, social cultural heritage and stuff like that. So even that, it's the beginning of us just organizing ourselves to understand ourselves better and reach out to one another better and ensure that our children know where they're coming from. So um, I have a question here from Sherry D. How can Isaliko descendants in the diaspora mobilize and support? Um, Arthur, will you take that in your presentation, when you're doing your presentation? Oh, no, well, okay, we have a website, www.omoisaliko.org. Um, send that message on omoisaliko.org and um, we have a lot of activities going on and things. COVID hasn't been very friendly with us this year. We've got um, our office, but I don't want to get into what our office is supposed to be talking about. So he will deal with that in his, um, um, in his presentation. So um, I will invite um, Mr. Alfaemi Bakreen, the secretary to the union, to just give us a brief background to who we are, where we're coming from, where we go. Good evening all. Hey, um, Baba, me. Working here. I do well on you for coming over. I do well on you for your support. I'm Ari Ibani Bagubu. I must say a very big thank you to uh, panelists also. Thank you very much. It's been, we've learned a lot and we're still learning. Um, I have, I'm supposed to talk on the brief history of the union, right. the scholarship fund and the future. Um, I wouldn't talk, we don't have too much time, so I, I wouldn't want to go into the history. Um, for those of us that have been lucky to, add, to have attended the past two editions of Isaleko Day, we still have uh, pictures, we still we have uh, video clips of it, and some of it we have thrown into the social media now. So we would hear from it a lot about the history of the, um, a, a lot about the history of the union. It's an Eco Descendants Union started out as an Eco Descendants Scholarship Fund Committee. 
though it had been in existence from time immemorial. Our father, president of the board of trustees, Alaji Femi Okunu, would always do justice to the history. And that's why I said, okay, I can always refer you back to the video clips that are all over so that we'll take it from there. Um, but I will be speaking mainly briefly on the present and the future of the Saliko Descendants Union. To further accomplish our goals, various committees have been set up as the engine room of the union. The membership committee, they are to attract individuals of Isaliko descent to join the union. Scholarship committee exists to fulfill the objective of Isaliko Descendants Union to empower the less privileged persons of Isaliko to further their education and vocation. Environment, Environment Development Committee exists to fast track environmental regeneration of Isaliko. Culture Committee to promote the cultural heritage of Isaliko and attract tourism to Isaliko through periodic events like this. Education Trust Fund Committee to promote quality education through direct funding and active involvement in policy formulation. Um, the Education Trust Fund looks at the bigger picture than the scholarship fund. Then we have a planning committee. The planning committee is the think tank of the executive. Members of this committee are saddled with the coordination of all social activities like Isaleko Day and this symposium that is happening now. We have rented a two-story building in the heart of Isaleko, opposite the Obas Palace of the Gadugoro. This has given us the opportunity to be more visible amongst our people. Work is, however, go on going to get a permanent site in Isaleko activated. Earlier in the year, earlier this year to 2020, we distributed 3,000 face masks in Isaleko, and we also gave full stops as palliatives during the COVID-19 lockdown. So these are some of the things we've been doing, uh, like uh, Kofo, right, my sister Kofo mentioned, rightly mentioned, uh, the pandemic had really dist distorted a lot of our plans, and, but we're still going on. That's why we're here today and moving on. For the future, as we resume into the new year 2021, barring all unforeseen circumstances, we hope to continue our receiving applications and conducting interviews for our indigent students. This time around, we have extended the scheme to include all tertiary institutions, that is universities, polytechnics, colleges of education, and vocational institutes. It is important for me to state at this juncture that all, F, all our efforts and successes so far achieved have been because of the immense support we get from our grand patron of our real one, Oshoolale Akiolu, our ever supportive and highly respected board of trustees, and the generality of our indigents that are already members of the union. A lot more still needs to be done. Hence, we're calling for the support of families, philanthropists, and corporate bodies to partner with us. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for listening, and enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you. Was supposed to be uh, making a request or asking for um, donations to the Saleko Scholarship Fund. We do this every time we gather, but um, we're not going to make it a long journey out there. If you're interested in finding out or you want to give um, a scholarship, um, give a donation to the scholarship, then reach out to any one of us in this um, fabric. <laughs> or go online to www.omoisaleko.org. And so just before our chairman, 
Mr. Ayumi Tokasi, I would like to say thank you very much to our panelists. Thank you, Mr. Ashupos Hashare. Thank you, um, Bilikis Adebi Abiola, Professor Adeli Jinodu, Dr. Taibat Lawanson, and Ed Kiazo. And um, also, very important, I want to say, ah, uh, Monsieur Charles, representant de Alliance d'Alliance Française et de Mike Adenuga Center. Merci pour votre soutien. Oh, should I go one step further? Ed, Becca, Dalu, email off one. Basically, thank you, everyone. And you know you are a shall do it. Trustees, thank you very much. I invite Chairman for his closing remarks. Thank you very much, everybody. Let me say that though, when we had a meeting and we were discussing going to symposium, I was not one of those that was actually supporting it. But with the panelists and all we've listened to today, I believe is a is a, is a way to go. I'd like to thank the lawyers for coming. I'd like to also thank the Alliance Francais for providing this conducive environment for us to have this meeting. The panelists, thank you very much. I think for the first time, we are scratching the surface of where to go. We've been having all these things for the first two, but this, for this time, the symposium is like directing us where to go, how to go about it. We thank you all for that. To the members of the executive, I thank you. And then to listeners and viewers, I thank you all for coming. Thank you very much.